Good morning to the Americas. Good afternoon to Europe and to Africa. Good evening, China and Asia. After this demanding year of, for corporate governance and 2022, investors are putting a lot of pressure on boards, strong focus on ESG, on climate, the, obviously the geopolitical tensions, Russia, Ukraine, China. We hope that 2023 promises to be a new era for global corporate governance. And I emphasize the word global because that's why we're here and bringing hopefully some new priorities and new priority settings and considerations for boards and executive uh, committee members of global focused firms. In discussions with the NASDAQ and with INSEAD over the last months about the evolution of global corporate governance, we decided to join hands and efforts to educate boards through this webinar series as well as uh, senior executives about topics of what we consider major significance in running boards and firms. As, <clears throat> as far as we know, there's no other trilateral organization like the NASDAQ, SEEPS, and INSEAD of doing anything of this type anywhere on the globe. In this new webinar series, we seek to uh, discuss key issues around global corporate governance in and what is expected of boards in the new era. There's a lot of facts and putting all this in a, in a framework is very important to, for us to provide you insights also and guidance for the way forward. Hosted by SEEPS, the China Europe International Business School based in Shanghai with campuses around the world, INSEAD, and NASDAQ, we will be joined by thought leaders, both academic and practitioners, over the next months to look at the latest trends shaping global corporate governance paradigms and the impact on boards and duties and responsibilities in the coming years. Global. The idea is that uh, INSEAD being a leading powerhouse from Europe, SEEPS being a leading business school within China and in Asia and NASDAQ having a global outlook as well as a US per specific perspective gives us a global perspective here on global corporate governance. Georgina, maybe you can take a second and show us where the audience is coming from now that we mentioned about um, global. So we've all taken INSEAD, SEEPS and NASDAQ has reached out to our alumni, our people in our database and our CRM system who are on boards and are interested in board leadership. We see here a nice split between Europe, some in the US. It's very early morning in the US, so we expect that it's a little bit more challenging to, to join this call. South America, 1%. Uh, Asia, 17%. Africa, 11%. That's just great. Just really good. Um, and I guess my guess is that within Asia, we've got quite a few specifically uh, in China because of the SEEPS connection. Just so you know, today's uh, webinar will be recorded. It's being streamed live also over YouTube right now. It will be on our YouTube channel. And then both INSEAD, NASDAQ, and SEEPS will be distributing it out to its constituents or making it available after the call, after the webinar. SEEPS is China and Asia's leading business school it has alumni leading firms making revenue equivalent to that of the GDP of Canada. That's the relevance of SEEPS. It's pretty the firms behind SEEPS alumni. SEEPS alumni occupy almost 5,000 board seats of listed companies. INSEAD, one of Europe's leading power schools, has a deep and long tradition of executive education and research and teaching in the field of corporate governance and family business. Um, their research on corporate governance at INSEAD on, is multidisciplinary and touches on different academic areas within this field, very specific, with over fit and having hosting over 50 governance uh, events each year around the world. So this is the powerhouse behind INSEAD. Both SEEPS and INSEAD focus primarily on board directors and executive boards in the training and the work that we do per se. 
NASDAQ has a little bit of a different focus. It powers 100 of the world's exchanges around the world. That is a very significant role that NASDAQ plays with running, the, it being the engine behind the board, but, but sorry, behind the exchanges of 120 exchanges. It's a systemic player uh, for global companies and therefore has a deep vested interest that firms on its markets are being well run. My name is Robert Straw. I'm the CEO of SEEPS Switzerland, uh, Zurich, and I'm responsible for the European operations at SEEPS. I've been professor of banking and finance at several different universities over the years and consultant to many, many firms. Sonia Tatar is the director of both Centers of Excellence in Corporate Governance, as well as the Center for Family Enterprise at INSEAD. She's a board director, she's an entrepreneur, and she's a CEO. Welcome, Sonia. Sonia, you're just coming off the back of your annual forum uh, on corporate governance, which, which took place at Fontainebleau outside Paris uh, last week, just last week. Uh, I know you've spent, you and your team have spent an amazing amount of time preparing this, basically a whole year from the last one. <laughs> Maybe you could share, really just coming off this global uh, global event, what were your, some of your key takeaways from your forum? Sure. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here. And of course, together with you, together with Byron, uh, SIPS and NASDAQ. And uh, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to join forces, the three uh, institutions to come together for such an important topic, which touches, you know, the drivers of corporate governance and drivers of business. So going back to your question about our forum, indeed, we had over 200 who joined us uh, physically in Fontainebleau. Mm -hmm. And the theme was governance imperative in the new world order. You know, we are in the same conversation. Where are we now? It's, a, 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 it's an era that is volatile, uncertain, complex. And we have addressed there, for example, are we globalizing, deglobalizing, re-globalizing? Um, uh, what is, uh, are we in a state of inflation, deflation, or even greedflation, which is um, something interesting as well to talk about? The disruption from technologies, the disruption from supply chain, but also we talked about the energy fracture, the energy conundrum that we have, and many, many of the issues. But as you see, I'm wearing yellow, I'm bringing the sunlight because after all, you know, there is there is uh, hope and we can look um, positively uh, for the future. So the key takeaways from this actually came, Robert and Byron, is that, uh, of course, boards need to be aware of what's happening the, about the externalities. Correct. And this is why, of course, we come together and discuss all the changes. And of course, um, we cannot manufacture certainty, which means boards need to operate under uncertain times, which means also they need to work with hypotheses and take decisions. Uh, although, of course, they are in charge of strategy short term and long term, but who knows the long term what is there? So we need to work with that. And we came to the conclusion, of course, and this is something you will hear today, we talk about uh, um, a lot of times is about resilience. So boards need to be resilient. What does it mean? Is they themselves resilient means they need to be flexible and they need to take decisions fast, change their operators' models, mm -hmm. but also they need to ensure that their organization uh, are actually resilient, which means they can anticipate shock, they can absorb the impact that they have, and the board, they have choices to make strategically. One, whether are we just adapting and adjusting, or the second one, whether we are reimagining our business and changing the future of this uh, direction of our companies. Hmm. So that's, what, that's overall what we have discussed and Great. the outcome. 
Well, you, you mentioned a whole bunch of topics that actually are, are webinar topics in and of themselves. And we'll we'll be looking into this in the in this sampling in this next hour together as we have this inaugural, what I call this an initial uh, launching of the series. Later, dear audience, we're going to be taking deep dives into some of these very specific topics that Sonia's brought up. Thank you, Sonia. Byron Laughlin is a friend. He's an entrepreneur. He's a CEO. He spends a lot of time also at board meetings and, and gets a feel for maybe not at huge conferences like at Sonia's just been running, but really speaking to the board members, being in the meetings themselves. He is the global head of NASDAQ's board advisory and NASDAQ Center for Board, for board Excellence. Both Sonia and I are also on this board as uh, on, the, on, the, on the advisory board. Byron, welcome. Byron, tell us a little bit why NASDAQ and how NASDAQ builds resilient markets and briefly its involvement in global corporate governance. Sure. Well, it's a pleasure being with Rob and Sonia. I, um, I consider both now friends in, and particularly in our efforts to work towards corporate governance excellence in the world today. I come out of the C-suite and from leadership circles in business, I, I've run a company, well, two companies, including the Center for Board Excellence that was acquired by NASDAQ a few years ago. And one of the reasons that acquisition occurred is because Adina Friedman, our CEO, set forward several years ago, maybe five or six years ago, a vision and a strategy at NASDAQ to build on the theme of, and Sonia brought it up first, is on resilient markets. Without resiliency in our markets, it will be difficult to have trust and to have resiliency within our economies. And so people need to trust that when they buy or sell, particularly in the public markets, but not exclusively because there's a lot of sub-markets that you can learn about through the things that we're going to do over the next year. By sub-markets, I mean private stock trading or just, uh, I have many private company clients. My work is primarily in the boardrooms of, of public companies and tends to be larger public companies in the United States, Australia, and, and bits of Europe. But one of the important parts about resiliency that Adina and the board at NASDAQ and we have agreed to is that good or great corporate governance, corporate governance excellence is intrinsic to resilient markets without corporate governance excellence. So when you look at yourself as a board member or C-suite member, are you, are you on that trajectory of being one, corporate governance effective. The day a company starts, every time I've started four companies, I started a corporate governance activity. The second you fill out the first form, that's the first corporate governance form. Years later, if it becomes public, you're doing things like 8Ks, 10Ks, and all these difficult, sometimes difficult uh, forms and reports for different reporting and, and uh, regulatory agencies around the world. That's a continuation of, of trust in the marketplace and resiliency in the markets. So those are the first two principles that would connect together that we join hands. And, and look, NASDAQ's not the only one doing this. I, I, would, uh, I would assert that all of the exchanges, there's a board member or a leader someplace in your circles of influence that are pursuant of those two principles. So it's great being with my friends from uh, from Zurich and Fontainebleau this morning in the United States. And uh, let's Thanks, go. Man. Let's talk about great corporate governance. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that intro. Um, Georgina, maybe you could show the next slide. So we asked you in advance, um, and I apologize for the way we asked it. We asked an open-end question. We should have said a Set, set the roles, but we've got 18% directors here. We've got 10% saying they're CEO, 6% uh, managers and so forth. 
So next time we do this, we're gonna we're learning as we're doing this, and uh, we're gonna ask some very specific questions. Are you, you know, a non-executive board member or your executive board, and some nuances, so, and so that we can learn better about the audience um, that that is here on the call, and so that we can learn more about what your needs are as we develop this web series going forward. Um, but there we see that. Um, I'd like to show the next slide. These are some of the topics that we believe are the hottest topics and potential future topics for this webinar series. And what we're going to do in the next 30 minutes is a, in a very short sampling, we're going to go bounce back and forth between Sonia and Byron and with me moderating to talk about these seven or seven different topics. As you've got questions coming up, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we will be entertaining some of these questions uh, in, in a little bit when we get to a QA. and a okay? So we'll be watching this. We've got a team watching the, the, the questions coming in. I can tell you with the number of people on, online, we won't be able to answer everything. And if it's too hot politically, we probably won't go there. Um, we know China decoupling, Russia, uh, Ukraine are big important topics that boards must have a view on. But that's the whole thing. It's what their view is on the impact for their firm, not the view on the policy per se. So that's some of the things we'd like to talk about. So remuneration and compensation for performance. This is a really, really big topic, especially as we're looking right now in the U.S. Uh, I'd like to go to, with you there, Ford Byron, about why is why is this topic so important uh, for us to be bringing it up as one of the seven main topics for next year in this in this series. Sure. Prior to the pandemic, you had pay ratios were becoming, had become and were becoming hotter and hotter topics. As we went into the pandemic, that, that was set to the side just a bit because we were focused on much more um, you know, strategies to survive rather than concerns about remuneration. And also a lot of, a lot of people um, um, froze their pay in the United States during that period. Now we've come out Ostensibly, we believe we've come out of the pandemic in the United States. If you travel, if you haven't traveled in the United States in the last six months, it looks normal again. Every place I was in New York, I was in Philadelphia the last couple of days, looks normal. And um, we're, we're fortunately, we're wearing masks a bit more. And, and I think that's uh, healthy and sustainable. But um, so pay ratios were becoming an issue because they, they set a threshold. Now, what's evolved is that the securities exchange in the United States, the SEC has said, is mandating, is beginning to mandate more disclosures in areas, particularly if you think in terms of ESG, around E and S issues. And one of the key, um, and, and it's, if you will, going back many years, it was, it was really G, E, and S but I'm told that it was a little less sexy. So someone told Kofi, Kofi Annan in the 2004 um, in, in his talk to use ESG, it's just rolled off the tongue better. So it's whenever you hear us speak about ESG, it's really the umbrella of governance with all of these other things underneath it. Good. And, um, and pay for performance is a formal term now in the AC, SEC nomenclature that will be a hot issue in a couple of ways. One, it's a hot issue because there's a lot of pushback or blowback saying it's way too complicated. Mm -hmm. The other is the timing on it, just because there's so much going on in the, in the um, C-suite and in the boardroom. And it, it's something that was in the U.S. Congress for many years. It was finally pushed and said, do something about this. That's why it's being pushed through now. It's not necessarily any special timing. It's more that the SEC feels the pressure from the legislative and activists and certain activist communities to get something done. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to hear a lot about pay performance. When you go and look at, if you're a board member that has a relationship in the United States, it's worth going and looking at some of the calculations required online, because if you're gonna be on a compensation committee, 
something is going to pass, whether or not it passes in this cycle or next year, we'll see because there's there's been letters, several letters written to the SEC to okay. delay this for six months to a year, but it's a very hot topic. And we're expecting new legislation to be forthcoming and therefore it should be on the tips of the tongues of, of boards around the world. What, what is what is happening in our market as well? If this because typically the United States drives a lot of the a lot of the, the 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 base of corporate governance, and it moves to other regions of the world accordingly. Not in all areas. I think ESG Europe Europe is uh, SNG is Europe has actually been uh, more of a, a leading a role player than 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 the United States in many ways. Um, let's move on to the topic two. I'm not going to always ask each of each of you to comment on the others um, because we could again the idea is to give a sampling of these topics and we're going to take deep dives later. The second topic we talked about having a webinar on is data monitoring, risk, and cybersecurity. I read this morning in PwC's recent directors uh, a survey that I forward to both you, Sonia, and and Byron. I don't know if you've seen it. But I, I just received it last night, so I haven't had a real chance to read it through, but I read the executive summary very early this morning. And one thing it said was 90% of all board directors say they have no cyber issues. Ah, I was absolutely shocked. So I know, Byron, you've got to hold your tongue. I know you've got a lot to say on this, too. But <laughs> how can it be that we put this as number two topic when 90% of the board members say it's not a topic? Well, um, it's very interesting, and thank you, Robert. And actually, you see that uh, we've done many studies as well, whether it's ESG, whether it's climate, whether it's uh, remuneration, nomination. Between what the boards say and the actions, we notice there is always a gap. So one thing they say, yes, uh, we, we don't have uh, cybersecurity issues wherever, but at the same time, the first element is, does the board have the literacy for cybersecurity? This is one. When you ask questions like this, then you realize, mm, actually we don't. We, we are lacking and we need more of that. The second thing is also, uh, the, the cyber attacks and the cyber market is moving so fast. And uh, we are, the market and businesses are becoming more and more vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. So if the board is not putting in place cyber security or data, you know, uh, the system and management and also, you know, like plan, this can hit very, very uh, bad. And the thing is that the board is not for them to be the ones putting in place all of this, but working with the executive team, ensuring that they have a preventive uh, system. For example, a culture hmm. that is preventive, that is looking at, okay, what do we do? What we look in, what we watch out and all of this. Then also be able to detect where are the vulnerabilities or where are the signs, the weak signs that can actually uh, make them be um, a ransom or something else. And then of course, they need to look at uh, the capabilities of their organization in cybersecurity, whether it's system, whether it's resources, people. So it is so important, as I mentioned earlier, one thing is they say, yes, we don't have the cybersecurity or maybe it's not an issue, but I know that many are actually saying this is top of our list. But the other thing is between their um, comprehensiveness of the cybersecurity market and issue versus what is happening in the reality. Right, thank you. I think um, we, you know, in this number two, Sonia, the words risk, um, I think we should have risk plastered across this, this whole, this whole slide, actually. Um, I, I mentioned to both of you recently, I had, I had, was able to talk to the vice chairman at NASDAQ through connection from Byron with Bob McHughie, and he, he was saying, you know, boards just don't know enough about risk and all the different things. Be it cybersecurity, be it and 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 and, 
So maybe we need to have, a, we should talk about this. Maybe we need to have a whole separate webinar specifically on what are all the categories of risk, just to. Absolutely, yeah. Robert. And the thing here, like there is not only data risk, financial risk, mm. business plan risk, uh, all you name it, the risks are coming from all over the corners. And uh, of course, we're not here to put uh, gray zones or gray area for the audience today, but this is the reality. And what we do is that our role is to help boards to prepare for all of this so that uh, they, you know, like Byron said, it's important to have resilient organizations and resilient markets. And Rob, uh, one way for folks to think about risk, just so you have a visual, is a Rubik's Cube. One of those little, um, I wouldn't call it a toy because it's more challenging than a toy, but a Rubik's Cube, and each of the squares is a risk. And so when, and, and think about this, when you hold up the Rubik's Cube, you can only see three sides. So three sides are invisible. So you have to turn the Rubik's Cube. When you think about the duty to care, think about the responsibility to know a little bit about each square. CEO succession is a Rubik's Cube square in the area of enterprise risk management. So as a highly responsible director, somebody who's gone to Sonia's classes and um, that you, you understand how to turn the dials of the Rubik's Cube to find ways working with your fellow board members and C-suite to line up the risks effectively. That's so I hope idea. you take that away as an image because each one of our seven here are spots on the Rubik's Cube. Right. And then there's metaphor. others. That's a great metaphor. In fact, you know, INSEAD and SEEPS being business schools, you know, we're, we're training this level of, of executives around the world. And, you know, the, the number of courses that we're both offering in the area of crisis management now and the area of business continuity is absolutely at its peak because of COVID, because so many companies got caught not, have, not being prepared at all really not even having this plan B in case something crashes, you know? Um, and so we, we need to be better prepared and to learn to turn that cube regularly, regularly turn that cube and a mechanism to have that turn. Let's move to topic three, sustainability, stewardship, and ESG integration. Byron, what are we talking about here? So ESG, or, or as I described, the, the G with the E and S underneath it, we've got areas, and, and you're going to read a lot about how this is under fire in the United States right now. We're going to make sense out of this um, as we go on. I was spent yesterday at a uh, conference that in Philadelphia where this was the specific topic of discussion in the background. Governance excellence requires paying attention to E and S. There's not a director out there that doesn't have some agreement in that. I mean, S are things like human trafficking and um, reasonable pay and, and um, key areas in board diversity, diversity in our workforce, recognizing the needs of the customers in a new way. The E is is greenhouse gases all the way through clean water. And there's not, I, I doubt there's a director out there that wants their grandchildren to be drinking bad water, um, breathe, breathing toxic air and things like this. So one of the things that we do, that this group is going to do is help you make sense out of the noise around things like ESG. And when you think about Stuart, Stewardship and sustainability, these are great words because they both have a lot to do with being a responsible business person, regardless of your role in the business. You want a sustainable business. That means sustainable uh, environmentally, and it means sustainable economically. You want it to stick around. And stewarding that business, it's a great word for the way we think as board members to be responsible for these activities that our company um, works through and wrestles with day to day. I think we need to do shout louder. 
I think we need to shout louder about this. Here's why. Again, referring back to this PwC report says only 45% of directors, less than 50% directors believe that ESG issue, that the ESG issue is can actually have an impact on their company performance. So I take that as a, as a, as a challenge to all of us. Well, my goodness, that we've got some serious education to do here, right? The, the fields are ripe, right? The, Sixty-five percent haven't been to one of your two classes. Exactly. No, no, really. It's, it's I'm, when I read through some of these, yeah, it's fairly shocking. It's fairly <laughs> shocking. And this is a this is a major study, multi you know multinational study, uh, thousands of directors taking part. It wasn't like just a few people in, in Southern Switzerland doing this or something. This was a global study. Um, and I'm just absolutely shocked at the naivety that I'm hearing from boards that we don't have an issue in cyber. We don't, ESG won't make a difference. Um, you know, only 11% of directors think that environment and sustainability is important for the board. 11%. There's 89% 89% of the people in the room, we've got to really work on that, right? That's a that's a pretty telling story. Let's move and, on. And you oh. know, Robert, on that point, actually, you have those who are what we call deniers, yeah. means they are waiting and say, let's wait and see what's going to happen. However, regulations are moving and they will be one day or the other pushed to move forward and then they find themselves catching up. The second ones are in the awareness stage while others, they pass the awareness stage. However, they are questioning, how do we do this? This is so complex, which we understand. Eh? ESG is not... But again, it's a journey, so uh, they, they cannot ignore it in a way. And I'll put a plug in, Rob, for Paul Pullman's book, uh, Net Positive. Right. Yeah. Paul uh, ran Unilever for years. Does a There's a great case study on Unilever versus Kraft Heinz. Unilever outperformed Kraft Heinz, utilizing um, key aspects of sustainable sustainability stewardship and ESG integration. Mm. So why is it that the, it's something that came up about reporting around this, that if it's, it seems to be that a lot of firms believe that unless it's regulated, we don't have to do it. Uh, that's indirectly what I was hearing between the lines, Sonia, Absolutely. right? The reporting, right? So of course, you know, you, you've got teams now just absolutely the amount of reporting on this is, is gone already over the top. We all know that There's, we've got an issue there. However, there's so many issues that firms aren't aren't willing to even touch. Um, it's a challenge. Let's move to corporate. Let's move to corporate culture and setting the tone from the top. In the discussions, in these we've we had many uh, dear audience. We've had many pre discussions leading up to today's webinar and, and 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 meetings actually in Paris together and discussing what are the topics, how we want to do this. Corporate culture came up over and over and over and over. We read it on LinkedIn 20 times a day, how important ESG is, how important corporate culture is. What, what do we mean here by corporate culture, Sonia? Yeah, when we talk about corporate culture, actually is the um, system that holds an organization together. Means corporate culture sits at the heart of the organization and ecosystem. So it comes with when we talk about vision, mission, purpose, and on the other side, we have the governance, and then we have the strategy and moving forward. So that's what holds it together. And when we refer to corporate culture, so of course here, the, the culture cannot be static because depending on where the organization is going, where it is today, and also where the organization would like to go and going back to ESG, for example, you need to build a culture for sustainability internally to drive the ESG forward, right? So for, for us, corporate culture is the mechanism that mobilizes and motivates uh, the engagement of the different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get into moving with your um, actually uh, objectives and where you're going. And the leadership has a critical role to play. And here I refer, of course, to the board. The first ones is they need to walk the talk. 
If you say we have a culture of authenticity, of trust, of collaboration, of so you walk the talk, but at the same time, you have the CEO who is the champion because the CEO is the one on the ground. And mm -hmm. then you build around this and you have your executives who influence your corporate culture. And of course you put systems in place and conversations internally. So it is corporate culture is how we call it, is the heart of an organization. The, the research that I did back in this 10 years ago uh, when I was working at KPMG found the following. Dr push companies need to push behavior first and then cultures follow the culture follows behavior so I, it's like smoking if i say to you as a smoker you shouldn't smoke you shouldn't smoke we can talk all day long about the merits and dismerits of smoking but until you actually stop smoking I, that's where the, the you know that's going to be the the different the, where the difference takes place is in your behavior right um, it's just an example. As a former smoker, I could bring that up. Um, you know, but focus first on behavior and yeah. then on the culture that the culture change that follows. You can't go in and preach to preach about something unless you're actually working on the behavior at the, exactly the same time. This has been shown over and over in many, many, many industries um, that this is the correct causality to do this. And we this is the whole point that we'd like to talk about. In, in this section and webinar on, on corporate culture and setting the tone from the top. And Rob, there, uh, David Barth asks, implies a question. The people attending a webinar like this are all often on the learning path. How do we get to the people who who aren't? Well, many of us are. I'm, I'm in boardrooms of, of people that um, are like what Rob has described um, quite often. And, and, and we're all three in seminars and activities. This is this is largely why we do what we do. Yeah. I am doing this, and, and I know that Sonia and, and Rob think like this. This is disruptive. What we're trying to do is to um, take into the marketplace these kinds of things, because as, as Peter Drucker said, and, and in the background for all of us, culture will eat strategy. Mm -hmm. You have a terrible culture. Mm -hmm. It's going to destroy your corporation. You look at the Enron kind of companies of history and you will and there's some that are happening now that um they they will destroy the culture and what happens that the share price goes to a point where somebody else buys it and integrates it into a, another company and improves the culture and then the employees like that they've been bought so there's there's that's the great thing about the the marketplaces today and then the, it's it's also important that we understand that ESG is evolving around the world mm -hmm. and there are, and this is a cultural part of corporate governance in general in the world. Mm -hmm. And it is evolving rapidly in the United States. There are a lot of companies that are not on the radar. This isn't on the radar yet that have changed their committee structure to have ESG or ESG related committees. Mm -hmm. To Rob's point, they're leaders and they're affecting the others who are more fast or even slow followers in these areas that we're talking about specifically to culture and ESG and integration. Thanks, Byron. Uh, to David Barth's questions about how do we, you know, we're preaching to the converted a little bit. We know that on these types of calls. So we do something at SEEPS on, on our marketing events. We call it a one plus one. So next time, David, and all of you, bring a friend. Bring a friend who you think should be listening to these types of things. Um, push, you know, put, it's not just about, uh, by the way, we're not selling anything here. This is a service that INSEAD, SEEPS, and NASDAQ is doing. This is actually work for us <laughs> more than anything. It's a cost for us. Um, but we're com so committed to this. Bring a friend next time. Send, send the link to somebody you think might need to hear some of these messages and might get a wake-up call through one of these. Um, it's like bringing a friend to church, I guess, <laughs> something like that. Uh, let's move on. The fifth topic is very serious. The geopolitical impact strategic on, on uh, ge geopolitical impacts and situation is, you know, we go through uh, peaks and valleys with these situation over, over decades. 
And right now, it seems to be we're at a very low point in lots of ways. The amount of uh, embracing and bridge building is at its very lowest. I want to point fingers. I want to be best. I want to only look out for my firm and my country and my family and not look out for the community or the world community. Um, one of the reasons around the global corporate governance that we've brought this up is because of this topic. We believe that global leaders need to be reaching the hand out across the aisle to the other side uh, in all these ways. And I'm talking about this from a business perspective. Um, Sonia, thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. I think this is a very, very important uh, um, angle as well into the boards and when they rethink about their strategy. OK, of course, there are tensions around the world. There are pressures, but this is where they need to actually look at um, whether they look at additional capacity in their home country, in neighboring countries, or even what we see now and more and more coming is about partnerships growing. So in times of ge geopolitical tensions and pressure, of course, there is um, looking at, uh, of course, resilience and how are we prepared to move our operation supply chain that is disrupted production and also people. But at the same time, how can we be innovative, creative and go think differently, right? So that we don't let like geographies or markets limit our strategy and limit our uh, growth in, in the future. And then one of the things what we say, of course, there is the political and there is the politicized. Mm -hmm. We live in a politicized world because in a way is that well, the boards work with so many stakeholders where they need you know, to balance their acts between the stakeholders, they need to take decisions. And there, of course, it's not about uh, ignoring some stakeholders or other, but you cannot respond to all the asks and all what is coming around you these days. As we see boards, are, their scope is expanding more and more. So how do you actually manage and navigate through all these asks from different stakeholders? And that's also another asset and a skill to do. Thank you. So we'll be, we're going to take a specific look at that in one of the deep dives. Um, China. I get asked to speak a lot on China in my role as being born in the U.S. and having been living in Europe for 30 years and now working deeply with Chinese firms and organizations and the leading business school in China. I, I feel like I've got a good eagle's eye view above all of this for, for China. I help firms understand how to work better with Chinese firms and deal with the realities of dealing with China. Qu what Questions like, what about decoupling? What about this? What about that? And I always emphasize on, let's not look at the, at, at, at the policy per se. Let's focus on the impact and the decisions of our firm in that regard. When talking to boards, it's it's shocking how few have a clear understanding about their relationship to and from China. So one of my very first things to say would be is, what is your firm's policy about working with China? How much of your business, of your sales sales is with China is in China, and how much of your supply side is coming from China? And that is very intertwined with our point five of the of the geopolitical when we talk about multi multilateral multilateralism or globalization or reglobalization or regionalization or whatever you want to call it. It goes hand in hand with that. And whether it's China or Korea or whatever, you have to have on a board, you have to have a view from the top and direction from the top about these issues. Byron, anything on China? I know you've got a, a, some views on this as well. 
Well, in the United States, there's a lot of discussion around decoupling from China. I think that's too strong a word and it's not realistic. I think it is, it, it has a lot to do, with, and this is a, a, a hot topic in boardrooms. That is the supply chain challenges over the last three years has caused the supply chain experts to look at what, of our, what are our options to have diversity in supply chain. Many economies are becoming much more sophisticated and they're offering alternatives to, to in a sense, just China. I think it's going to be China and not China or that right. we need to think in terms of we are a globalization has an implication as a word that means one thing. It, it We are a global world today. You can jump on an airplane and go all over the world. It's amazing where you can go and how easy and inexpensively you can go. That's not going to change. Um, some things are going to change because of the other things above, like ESG. I mean, how do we fly as much as we have in the past economically in terms of sustainability for our planet? Yep. That's a question. But in, in terms of what we're seeing, we're seeing supply chains change. What I would say that's most important for board members on this topic related to what we're doing this today is understanding the supply chain changes. Right. It's kind of like understanding cybersecurity. You don't have to be a supply chain expert, but you do need to, in a sense, have a visualization of a dashboard of what's changing in the world that impacts your decision process as a board member. And what you're you sitting there listening and you're listening to a presentation on supply chain. You should have a question that's pertinent to what the board is discussing around supply chain. And we would hope over the next year that we help you clarify in each of these seven categories, but particularly in supply chain, the kinds of questions that board members should be asking that are pertinent in the boardroom. Thank you. Final topic, um, and this is a topic dear to all three of us. Two of us are old white male of the old guard on this call, um, but we're actually, Byron and I both are very actively engaged in training programs for women and other, other underrepresented bodies uh, 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 on boards. And it's, it's our personal mandate to give our time, pro bono time to invest in this space towards this issue of women and diversity on boards. Having said that, again, uh, some more facts, 80%, 86% of board directors say that diversity enhances the board. That's great, 86%, but 14% <laughs> still say are holdouts. That's still pretty ridiculous. 30, only 34% say that the new, meaning the new diversity members are needed. So that's a, a little bit of a conflict. And only 31% 31, 31 say that the, these new members, women and other underrepresented bodies, are unqualified. So we've got a new law into place in Europe. And when we were preparing last week, Sonia, you seem skeptical about this new EU law mandating the number of women on boards. Thoughts? Yeah, so it's not being skeptical per se, means I'm against or anything. What happened is that what we see these quotas, normally they are there to push the needle to make the change happen, right? For anything, regulators and regulations, that's what actually they help the momentum. However, my point here is that we should not go and appoint a woman or uh, diversity for the diversity per se, which is tick in the box. It, competencies and value add, value creation is the key uh, component in here. So for me, what happens is, is that with this 
40% is that once we see, for example, we open is to be fair, to have a fair process that men, women, or, you know, different uh, um, categories and diversity have their fair process in this. After is the decision should always be made on competencies and value creation. Right. I, th I think all of us are in agreement with that. We don't want them. You, you should hold out. If you don't find the right qualified person, Absolutely. you hold out on filling that space, right? If you're committed to having a, per a person, uh, a woman or a, a underrepresented group in that slot, just wait and keep looking until you find. And that's true for a, a executive roles in the firm as well. Don't just fill that slot, right? Because, yeah. Byron, any thoughts on this? Well, Rob, one of the um, uh, Hagen uh, commented in our chat about inclusion. I assure you that inclusion is a critical part of the work that we are doing. I have spent um, a better part of my life working on diversity and inclusion issues. I understand how the word diversity can, can get um, watered down and that inclusion is important because it's the difference between being invited to the party and really being a part of the party, exactly. being on the dance floor, getting the glass of champagne when you walk through the door, these kinds of things for the party. It is, it is critical. Now, in terms of the, the shift of diversity, I do tend to be on le working with leading edge boards. Mm -hmm. I can... Um, all of the boards that I've worked with that are large multinational companies see diversity as essential, yeah. not just a good idea. Right. It's understanding the customer. It's understanding the workforce. It's understanding trends. Without diversity, we're behind on trends. If you're not pursuing diversity in your boardroom and in your C-suite, you are slower in terms of trend understanding. And it's those who understand the trends most quickly that are you often the winners in economic circles, depending on where you are playing strategically around the world or in your marketplace. Great. And, and Robert here, one point just to make it clear is that when we talk about diversity, of course, we always go to gender. However, diversity is beyond diversity in thinking and, you know, background, education, expertise, all of this. So uh, just wanted to mention that because Absolutely. it's a broader perspective than just women. It's a diversity and inclusion, as some of the people were mentioning in the, in the comments. Yeah. Um, since we're on this, we'd like to get, dear audience, your inputs. We're, uh, we'd like to have a poll to see of these of these topics. Uh, Georgina, could you launch the poll? So we're going to ask you, which of these are the most important for you? And if there is a topic that you would like to see specifically brought up in a full webinar format, please use the chat function at the bottom and type in, in one or two or three words, your idea for the topic. If it's not mentioned in these seven, if you think that there's something very important that we're missing. So we've got about 38, 40% of you have uh, participated. We're gonna just keep this going for a minute. I, I will answer uh, while people are polling uh, a question that uh, is anonymous talking about the chief security officer of a Fortune 500 that right. says she doesn't care about diversity. Well, that, that, I think that she might not have cared that day, yeah. but uh, ultimately, over the long haul, people are caring a lot about diversity. Yeah. We all are influenced by leadership. Mm. When in, if you're able to come to an event at NASDAQ at some point in New York City, we're doing a, a lot of work around leadership effectiveness. Mm. And what you will see is a diverse room with inclusive comments that get to the heart of the things that we will be talking about in terms of board effectiveness, 
leadership effectiveness in the boardroom that mm -hmm. require diversity. Great. Um, let's, get, Georgina, can we end the poll? And let's see, can we show the poll results? Can we do that? So we've got remuneration, compensation, 34% would like to hear more. 41% would like to see more on data monitoring and cybersecurity. 49 on ESG and sustainability. 51, corporate culture. Great. It starts with that at the very top. 42 with geopolitical, 20 with China specifically, and 29 on this. This helps us a little bit with the prioritization uh, dear audience, so thank you very much, um, Georgina, if you can capture that. Are there any surprises here, Sonia, for you? No, not really. I think um, the, these are, uh, we see the, the asks and the requirements come in. Yeah. No surprise for me. Yeah. Byron? Uh, no real surprises. I, I, I think if we said something like China and India, we would yeah. see a difference. And, and I want to assure folks that are interested in India, we do recognize yeah. that China and India will be vying for the largest economy in the world over the next 10 years. We're not negating India whatsoever. We are just focusing a bit on China at this moment because at 2023, it's a hot topic respective to supply chains. Yeah. But India yeah. will be a topic along with other parts of the world, Africa, Africa, yeah, and 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 uh, Asia it will be topics in the future of what we're doing. We are going to explore the nooks and crannies of great corporate governance going forward. That's a part of the uniqueness of this, and we want you as attendees with us to feel very much a part of this. Um, supply chain of education that we need to share together around the world to be effective in corporate governance and both collectively and respectively in our boardrooms. Great. I like that supply chain of education. That's a great, um, great way to, to uh, define this, what we're trying to do. Um, I'm cognizant of time. Um, so what we're going to do, and I knew this was going to happen, we have so many more Q&A questions that we won't be able to get to, but we're going to capture them. And as we go into the, the, the deep dives in the next months ahead of us, we're going to be um, offering a, the webinar series about every two to three months. Watch our space. Both uh, INSEAD, SEEPS, and NASDAQ will be pushing this out through our different channels bringing you back here. We're going to address some of those in our preparation. We'll also attempt to, in the background, um, attempt to answer some of these questions in a, few, in a few sentences in the next weeks. And we will, anyone who's registered for this, we will make sure that we, you get a, verb, a, a written uh, kind of report on this, uh, on, on some of these questions. And again, we'll be answering them specifically in, in, the, in the webinars going forward. Could you show the last slide, Georgina? So watch this space. Stay tuned for the future webinars in the series. We haven't actually set the date, but it'll probably be towards the end of February. That's our guess after Chinese New Year and after the New Year and cl closing of the, of the books for, for most of these firms. Dear Sonia, thank you so much for participating. Byron, thank you very much. And dear audience, thank you very much for taking your time this morning, this afternoon over your lunch and, and, and early evening. Wish all of you well, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you very soon in our, in our next webinar series. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye -bye. you so much.